Empty supermarket shelves, gas pumps gone dry. Britain's current shortages remind some stalwart citizens of wartime hardship. A drastic lack of truck drivers has blocked deliveries of gasoline and food. One reason? Post-Brexit cutbacks on visas for foreign labor. Brexiteer Boris Johnson denies Brexit's to blame. At their recent conference, Tories called the current strains a sign of economic revival and vowed to look beyond Europe for new friends. Our topic today, Boris Brexit Boomerang. Is the UK spiraling into chaos? Hello and welcome to To The Point. It's a pleasure to welcome our guests. Vendeline von Bredo is the Berlin-based correspondent for the British weekly The Economist. And she says Boris Johnson famously wrote two newspaper columns arguing for and against Brexit just before the referendum. He must deeply regret sending the wrong one. It's also a pleasure to welcome John Worth. He's a British freelance journalist and blogger. His opinion, Brexit didn't cause the problems the UK is currently facing, but it has removed many of the means Britain had to solve those problems. And I'm very glad to have my colleague Simon Young, a political correspondent for Deutsche Welle, on the show. He says, Boris Johnson says the problem actually shows the, US, the UK economy is strong, but many Britons doubt he has a plan to deal with the problems. Vendelin, you say the Prime Minister has cause to regret his post-Brexit, uh, pro-Brexit enthusiasm. Is public opinion turning against Brexit? What are you seeing in the polls? No, not yet. I mean, not the, not the, the people who supported Brexit in the first place. Um, but I feel we are seeing a sort of parallel world. If you look at the pictures from the Tory party conference, you know, they were dancing the night away and there's a very good, upbeat mood. But then if you look at the rest of the country, you know, the empty shelves, the queues at the petrol station, people are upset and people are angry. But the, in general, public opinion is still, he's still very popular, the prime minister, so it's not turning yet. Although, John, in fact, there is one poll that's just come out from YouGov showing a slim majority, 53% of those polled, saying that, in fact, uh, they now see more downside from Brexit than upside. You say that Brexit didn't cause the problems the UK is facing. So would you say people are drawing the wrong conclusions if they, if they say this is the downside? If you unpick that a little bit, essentially the British are saying, hang on a minute, maybe Brexit itself is not the problem, perhaps it's the way that Boris Johnson is doing it. Right Now, I would say that there was probably no good Brexit to be had, but theoretically maybe a, a Brexit that was not quite as damaging as this one would have been possible. Um, what you have to bear in mind is that these shortages of labour in the British labour market, they have not just suddenly come about in the last six months. Britain has not been um, uh, training enough truck drivers, enough doctors, enough nurses for two decades now. And the, e the UK could plug the gaps in its labour market with labour from other European countries. Now, out of the European Union, it can no longer do that. But these problems predate Brexit by quite some years. It's just we're seeing the consequences now. And so, of course, the fact that Britain is hit harder than other European countries, of course, is then in the public debate somewhat connected to Brexit. So, Simon, your opening statement said that uh, people question whether the prime minister has a plan. But in fact, he gave a rousing speech at this week's Tory party conference saying that the fuel shortages are proof that the plan is working, so to speak, that they're part of a glorious high wage future. Uh, is that convincing? Well, they, the, the government's got this sort of complex narrative that, uh, you know, they went into COVID pretty much at the same time as, uh, as the Brexit, uh, as Brexit happened. Uh, and uh, now things are coming back on stream. There's surging demand. Uh, and uh, because there's been sort of lumpy uh, uh, consumer demand during the, the, the COVID-19 crisis, um, you know, now we're seeing surging demand and that, you know, that, that they, they, the problems are proof of it. Um, well, is it convincing? I don't know. I think as Wendelin said, you know, there's going to be a lot of people who, is, who are losing confidence, who will lose confidence if this crisis 
continues, uh, particularly in the run-up to Christmas. If uh, British people can't get their turkeys uh, in time for Christmas, that's going to cause trouble. And, and let's dig a bit deeper, in fact, uh, on the crisis and the outlook. Some economists are calling the fuel crisis a warning sign for the country's economy overall. Could the costs of Brexit prove higher than Tory Brexiteers claimed? Empty gas pumps and long queues outside the service stations that still have fuel. Great Britain is in a state of chaos. With an estimated shortage of 100,000 truck drivers, the supply of much needed gasoline is running dry. It's just frustrating. I just want to be able to get fuel and go to work. Suddenly all these drivers were missing. Where have they all gone? Back to the EU. So, yeah, no, it's not really very good. To be honest, it's chaos. Absolute chaos. Supermarket shelves across the country lie empty too. This is due to a shortage of cheap labour from the EU, as a result of Brexit. Other sectors of the economy have also been affected. They include the service sector, skilled trade and agriculture. We've lost the type of labour that made the UK really strong. They've gone back to Europe. They're going to make Europe strong. Can Boris Johnson and his Tories get a grip on the Brexit mess? Let me pass that question straight on uh, to you, John. In fact, the fuel shortages are easing somewhat now that the government has called in the army to help deliver petrol. So does the government now have things under control, would you say? I'm not sure the government does have things under control because there are multiple crises here, as, as your report adequately demonstrated. And indeed, there are a few other things you could have additionally mentioned. There's some difficulties um, in the, the uh, farming industries, for example, or even getting chemicals for, for, for processing sewage. So there are all kinds of difficulties right across the economy. But for me, the really interesting point is short term versus long term. There are labour shortages which we know about right now. So if you patch it up for delivery of petrol to fueling stations, you're potentially going to cause a bit of a problem more, that's more severe for the delivery for your supermarkets. And to train new truck drivers is going to take months. To train new veterinary surgeons or to train new doctors is going to take years. So to get to this kind of promised new land that Boris Johnson is talking about, that's going to take a long time. And it's going to be very problematic in that interim period. So I don't think the British government has, has a plan at all. The idea of managing to recruit truck drivers to, to sort out their shortage, the Times newspaper this week reported they recruited just 27 new truck drivers. That's going to be a drop in the ocean um, with regard to the thousands that they're short. Vendeline, uh, certainly your newspaper, The Economist, uh, has cast doubt on whether there's a convincing plan. Wages for truck drivers, though, have in fact taken a sharp upturn in the course of this year. So is the labour market responding? Are British citizens now jumping in to fill those jobs? Well, they're still not jumping in. Wages have been rising and there is a shortage of lorry drivers everywhere in, 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 in Europe and in Britain. Only in Europe you can compensate more easily because, you know, they can move from one country to the other and, and basically alleviate the most acute shortages. The thing is, truck driving is a very, not that I've ever done it, but from reports I know it's a very, very tough job and it's not very attractive. So there's still an acute shortage and maybe wages have to rise even more just because it's such a hard job. So, Simon, the government has also now expanded the uh, contingent of allowed visas for foreign drivers. Will that solve the problem? Uh, well, it could do. I uh, hear that uh, Bulgarian truck drivers are saying, you know, they, they might be tempted back. But uh, actually, there's a problem in Bulgaria as well. They haven't got enough truck drivers there. So... Uh, as was said, freedom of movement is one way to solve this, but we don't have freedom of movement between the EU and the UK anymore. Uh, it's a drop in the ocean. I think the figure given is 100,000 truck drivers who, who, are, who are missing, as it were, who are needed. How to get them back in? Partly it's also a problem, by the way, of, uh, uh, of an ageing workforce. People have been dropping out. It's a structural problem. The government could have had a role in solving it, not only the government, I suppose, industry as well. Um, and, uh, you know, it, Boris Johnson and his government are relying on industry to, uh, on the logistics industry uh, to, uh, to solve these problems. But the Road Haulage Association, the, kind of the, the association for, for, for this industry, has been screaming about this problem for years, saying we've got these difficulties, we need to 
overcome those problems. And the government has not been listening. Uh, and so that's why I ultimately conclude this is too little, too late. And that's why this problem, one way or another, even if we solve it in the fueling stations, the impacts are going to be felt across the rest of the, the economy for some time to come. Certainly, the, the, those in the industry are still very concerned that even if we solve it right now for the fueling stations, the problems will persist. And in fact, it's not only businesses in that sector that are complaining, but uh, we're hearing a lot of complaints. You mentioned farmers uh, earlier on labor shortages at slaughterhouses are also generating some very bloody media reporting with pig farmers apparently culling their herds and killing healthy animals because they can't send the ones they intended uh, to to the slaughterhouses. What do you think this means longer term? Is the government going to have to water down its anti-immigration stance that was part of Brexit? We don't quite know at the moment. It's, it's slightly strange because the government at the moment has managed to more or less annoy everyone. Um, it's somewhat anti-immigration voters now see that maybe the government is opening up a bit again by with, with this emergency visa scheme for, for truck drivers. The farmers might potentially be next. Um, while at the same time, the anti-immigration sentiment in the UK and indeed labour shortages, as we've just been talking about in other European countries, will say, well, OK, if I could potentially choose as a worker, would I like to stay in Germany or in France or go to the UK for a short period of time where my, my position in that job would not be guaranteed, I think the British government would have to do quite a lot more to persuade a lot of those EU workers back to the UK than it's been done, than it's done so far. And, Vendelin, if we look at the numbers, I mean, as far as I know, the expanded contingent uh, is something like 5,000 visas. That's just a symbolic gesture, a drop in the bucket, isn't it's it? It's not only a symbol... It's, it's not enough, for sure, but it's also not a very attractive proposition. It's a, it's a temporary visa for, I think, three months and, um, and and for not enough people you know why why would you leave your job in Poland or in Bulgaria to return to the UK for three months and then you have to go back I, I don't think it'll work at all and I think they I think they may even drop the plan Simon anti-immigration policy it was an absolute pillar of brexit is it a red line do you think still for the conservatives or do you think that they may wind up retracting some of this in the face of a, an economic downturn, potentially. Well, as you've already said, they have relaxed it. They've they've offered these uh, a few thousand but minimally, mi minimally. A, a minimal relaxation. But that's kind of the new narrative they want to tell. Uh, Boris Johnson says we don't want to be a low wage, low skill economy, and we don't want to fuel low wages and low skills with immigration. That's what the way he tells it. So. Uh, we, we don't want immigration, we want uh, you know, our own workforce to do, do the high-skilled jobs. It's a little un unclear how that marries, as you said, with, with uh, truck driving, which uh, is not regarded anyway as a, as a high-skilled profession. Uh, but also the, the story of, of being able to change the rules around immigration rather nimbly, if I can use a, 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 a key word that the, the Brexit supporters have always said, that Britain would be more nimble in its regulation in future. That is something that they're quite proud of being able to do, actually. So they can tell a positive story. Uh, Boris Johnson's good for those. But, yeah, but, but, but yeah, that's, yeah. That's, not, that's not true, mm. ultimately, right? You basically had a pool of labour of a, a few hundred million workers you could potentially call on. That was as nimble as you could possibly imagine. Someone can basically move on their own back from one country to the another, another problem solved. It's taken months of the, 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 the haulage industry screaming to say we need more truckers to get the British government to actually act. And then they've only done too little too late. So this is the very opposite of nimble, right? They're basically, the restrictions they put in place have actually made the problem harder to solve, uh, while at the same time they're saying, actually, this is, this is proof of the great kind of post-Brexit world. Mm. It doesn't actually add up. Britain benefited from freedom of movement, but no politicians are honest enough to actually say that up front. Vendelin, um, let me ask you how nimble you think the British government can be in dealing with some of the other Brexit-related problems that are coming its way. First of all, French fishermen, with France saying it may retaliate against uh, the UK for the fact that, that apparently the UK is not granting as many fishing licenses to the French as it had promised uh, in the Brexit negotiations. Secondly, a dispute with the EU Commission over customs controls in the Irish Sea, also out there on the horizon. Um, will these themselves have economic implications and how nimble do you expect London to be? 
I don't think Rundin has much room for manoeuvre. Um, and even, you know, this whole, as Simon mentioned, the whole sort of levelling up, you know, uh, higher skilled labour should be promoted and we want to uh, move away from the low wages and low skilled jobs. But I mean, some jobs in the economy are low skilled, you know, and they will always be because that's necessary and you can't just sort of do without. So that's one thing. As for the room for manoeuvre, I don't think London has a lot. I mean, they have to abide by the, the, the Brexit um, uh, agreement, um, you know, they are, they are the smaller, they are the David uh, against the Goliath. And, um, and, and it's actually, it's hard to understand why, you know, with the fishermen's licenses, why would they risk a fight over this? But, you know. Yes, I mean, I would just point out, David um, did rather well against Goliath. In the end. <laughs> you, can, um, you can certainly tell the story. That's the one they want to tell. I think the EU, um, if I could offer a piece of advice, should be, should be careful in these kind of disputes. You mentioned this one over fishing. Um, because it's very easy then for the Brexit supporters uh, to continue telling that narrative. Look, here's the, the big clunky EU that wants to bind us in with their regulations. Of course, this is pure populism. I see that. But, uh, you know, it's, it's much better to diffuse these uh, kind of tensions as I think the uh, European Commission is trying to do. But does, does the EU actually have to care? Basically, Britain's not going to rejoin the EU for a couple of decades. Okay. If actually playing a tough line towards the UK on fishing, for example, is popular among EU citizens who happen to live in France, why not? Yeah. Um, look at what's happening in Northern Ireland. Economically speaking, the only part of the UK that hasn't got a fuel crisis, hasn't got a supermarket shelf shortage, is Northern Ireland, because it works to have a close relationship with the, with the European Union. And so finally, the, perhaps a good thing from Brexit, as far as the EU is concerned, is it doesn't actually have to listen to the whining Eurosceptics in the UK anymore. And actually, it can side with European citizens who actually say, actually, we think that defending EU interests vis-a-vis -vis the UK, maybe that's not the worst thing. That's what I meant. There's not much room for manoeuvre. I mean, you know, they are the losing end of the equation, in my view. Yeah. I agree. I I'd like to uh, pick up on the word relationship and uh, take us a little bit further abroad because with Brexit, a done deal, the UK is now looking for a new role and new friends. One thing is clear, Britain's global position depends on new alliances in both security and trade. In a move reminiscent of a James Bond movie, Great Britain and the US snatched a lucrative deal from the NATO partner, France, securing the license to build submarines for Australia. A prestigious success for Boris Johnson in his search for new allies. The deal to modernize Australia's fleet of nuclear-powered vessels is a key building block of AUKUS, the new Indo-Pacific alliance between Australia, the UK and the US against China. French President Macron was furious about this, and he wasn't the only one. China, Britain's biggest trading partner since Brexit, was also enraged. This makes it all the more urgent for Britain to find new trading partners. But regardless of the submarine deal, US President Joe Biden has made it known that a trade agreement with Britain is not a priority for him at the moment. British Conservatives are therefore pinning their hopes on Kanzuk, a free trade zone between Great Britain, New Zealand and Canada. Is the United Kingdom really better off with its new partners than it was with the EU? The submarine deal, Simon, has given a, a post-Brexit Britain a moment in the sun, and it's being portrayed by the government, by Boris Johnson, as proof that global Britain is a vision that is attainable. Absolutely. In his uh, conference speech, Boris Johnson said this is the prime example of what Britain can do outside the European Union. Interesting that it's a it's a, a deal that really has defence implications. It's um, much less easy to see it as a... It's not, it's not, a, it's not a free trade deal, for instance, with the US and Australia. Um, it's a defence cooperation arrangement, and he said it's all about dealing with the challenges from China and the Indo-Pacific and so on. But he, he highlighted it as the thing that Britain can now do is it seeks to have sort of more global penetration. I hope uh, there aren't more 
uh, the, 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 that's not the tenor of Britain's global role in future, is to be a sort of military power projecting in every direction. Uh, but it's very interesting that that's where uh, we're seeing Brexit happen. John, we can do better alone was a very popular slogan during the pro-Brexit uh, campaign, which clearly, and it's a slogan clearly targeting Europe, but not English-speaking friends like the US and Canada and Australia, as we heard in the report. So how reliable are these alliances, especially when it comes to trade? Can they really replace the old torn ties to the EU? I don't think they can. And if you look at the statistics, we're pretty certain that they can't. But this was a very convenient campaigning slogan during the, the Brexit referendum. If, it may, if we have a harder trade relationship, which is a necessary price for trade with the EU, then we can compensate for trade with our old friends, the Commonwealth countries, Canada, New Zealand and Australia. Now, trading with three countries that are comparatively small and two of which are on the other end of the world is not an easy change to make. It doesn't make economic sense. And indeed, actually, in, at least in trade in some goods, some trade relationships with Australia and New Zealand are reasonably close already. So ultimately, this was more of a campaigning device than an actual workable plan for the post-Brexit economic relationships uh, that the UK wants to have. Ventolin, coming back to the dispute that we were talking about just before the report over the Brexit protocol and the Irish Sea, and it's a very complicated matter, but is Boris Johnson essentially playing chicken here with the EU Commission? And if so, who do you think will blink first? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> um, Hard to tell. I think ultimately Boris Johnson will probably blink first, as he has done on so many issues, you know, and, and, and even, you know, his, his agreement was worse than the one uh, Theresa May had negotiated. So I think if you ask me like this, I think he will blink first. Simon, is that just simply a sign of his nimbleness? <laughs> well, uh, the, the, certainly the British government's saying it's, you know, uh, over the next couple of weeks they're going to talk about um, potentially ripping up the Northern Ireland Protocol, trying to renegotiate one. I don't know on past performance whether it'll, whatever they might come up with would be better than what they've got now. Um, just to the point before, you know, why should the EU care? I think in the case of Ireland, Northern Ireland, uh, they really do care because peace in Ireland for everyone is a, is a paramount concern. Absolutely. But, but, but on that point, the British government hasn't dealt with exactly that problem, which is essentially to say, you've got to work out where you put a border one way or another. For the EU, a hard border in Ireland is unacceptable. The British government didn't want a border in the Irish Sea, but that's what they've got, and they've refused to accept honestly, that that's what their deal has, uh, has resulted in. And then if we bring it back to the economic questions, economically, there's a deeper economic integration between Northern Ireland and Ireland. And so therefore, economically, right, the, the, the whole island economy is still working comparatively well, right? So uh, uh, economic growth in Northern Ireland is stronger than in other parts of the UK just now. Um, and so therefore, is this really as big a problem as Boris Johnson wants to make out? Actually, the Northern Ireland solution is working. Brexit for the rest of the UK, so for England, Wales and Scotland, is where the problems are. Let me ask you this, uh, because the clock is running down uh, on our show. It's also running down on uh, Britain's first year outside of Europe. Our title was Brexit, uh, Boris Brexit Boomerang. And I'd like to ask all of you, even if a majority on the basis of the economic implications of all the different things we're talking about does conclude that Brexit was a mistake, is there any going back? Vendeline, where do you see Britain heading now as this first year outside of Europe ends? I think Britain, Britain will um, continue on its present course. First of all, um, the Prime Minister very firmly in his saddle and he's not going to, to, to go back on, on you know, all the... the I mean, the course he set the country on. However, I could imagine in 20, 30, 40 years, you know, but that's, that's in the longer term, there might be a move back to Europe, but not in the next 10 years. Simon? Well, I don't think the... I think the British government and increasingly the British people probably are moving on from Brexit. It's, it's a done deal, as they say. And what they, the, the government talks about now is a generation. You know, it'll take a generation before we see the results, the successes as they tell them, uh, and obviously the, the, the um, failures as other people would see it. So uh, you'll have to wait uh, if you want the answer, as it were. John? Simon seems to have been buying the Boris Johnson rhetoric there to say that it's a done deal. I think 
that Brexit as a whole is not in question. What seems to be happening is the kind of how it's carried out, the details are starting to be called into some sort of a question, right? Like that's been really shown by these shortages in supermarkets and in the fueling stations. And so therefore, there needs to be some kind of new relationship for Britain with the EU, but on the outside. And at the moment, no one other than Boris Johnson is even trying to articulate that. There's no opposition, really. The Labour Party is not really making headway to put forward some kind of an alternative. So I agree that there's no viable prospect to bring and rejoining the EU for some decades, but something has to change in the relationship because it can't stay as sort of unstable or tense as is the case currently. Our title also asked, is the UK spiraling into a chaos? Vendelin, last word, are we likely to see a chaotic 2022 for Britain? I think we'll see quite a tough winter. I mean, you know, there may not be enough turkeys for Christmas. And um, so, and, and you know, the, the gas price and the fuel price are very high. And that's tough in particular for the poorest in society. So I think the winter will be, it will be possibly a winter of discontent. It will be a very tough winter and a very difficult 2022. Thank you very much to all of you for being with us on To The Point and thanks to all of you out there for tuning in. See you soon.